Shang-Chi director in talks for Spider-Man 4, Marvel TV head teases special presentations, plus Joker 2's first reviews are mixed. All that and more coming up on this week's Multiverse News. Welcome to Multiverse News, your source of information about all your favorite fictional universes. On the panel today, we have our wonderful stalwart crew, Jay Sisson. What's going on, buddy? Hey, not too much. We got the gang back together, feeling good, ready to bring yes, the news. Did. Thank you for taking taking the, the wait last week, guys, everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs> I was out. I was out just tired, not sick, just tired. Um, <laughs> Haley Hobbs, how you doing? Doing amazing. We've got some interesting things to talk about today. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And Jay, Scotty, St. Clair. Yes, yes. I was also tired last week. I think listeners probably heard that in my voice, but uh, I showed <laughs> up anyway. No, no shade, no shade, but I'm fully rested and ready to go this week. So looking forward to it. Yes, thank you, Jay Sky. Jay Sky took took over and, and edited everything, and I really appreciated it. Uh, after Dragon Con, I was completely spent. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, uh, we we have our five star review uh, this week uh, from Caniac Can- Max. Caniac Max uh, says right. the <laughs> effort and time put into this quality podcast is evident. Keep staying classy. Ooh, thank you, you sir. Very kind. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Very very kind. Appreciate that. Um, all right. Well, I guess we can dive right into our first story. You guys ready to just get into it? Yeah. Oh yeah. Sweet. Ready to swing um, into it? Yeah, okay, swing into that first story. <laughs> 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 All right. The Hollywood Reporter broke the news that Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings director Destin Daniel Cretton is in talks to helm the fourth Spider-Man movie for Sony and Marvel Studios. While neither Sony or Marvel have provided a comment at this time, this is in line with previous reports and claims that the Spider-Man film with Tom Holland was being fast-tracked to begin shooting next year. Though uh, he only has one MCU feature under his belt. Creden is already beginning to feel like a bit of an elder statesman within the Marvel Studios stable of filmmakers. Having been previously attached to the Kang Dynasty before it became Avengers Doomsday and creating the Wonder Man series that is in production. Are our spidey senses tingling? <laughs> Yeah, Dustin Daniel Cretton kind of seems like that guy, and it shouldn't be felt as a slight that he got uh, put off of the Avengers movies now that we've got the Russo brothers back, and then he said he's getting a Spider-Man movie. I think that's actually maybe an equal step up in movie land, Mm -hmm. because this is kind of a big get for him. Um, My first reaction when I saw it was, but Shang-Chi too. I hope he's doing both, you know? We're not getting that Shang-Chi, too. (laughs) How very dare you, sir? (laughs) But I love this. I think that we saw really well what he did with Shang-Chi. It was such a well-constructed movie. You loved the characters you were supposed to love, and maybe even some of the characters you weren't supposed to love. I think that had one of the best villains we've seen in the MCU in quite a long time that really had some pathos. And that's a lot of the Star Star Wars (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> wrong universe <laughs> same company though so it's like that was uh, such a Freudian yeah, slip too <laughs> and that's such a big part of the spider-man universe you know spider-man himself is very you know he's a good guy but he's got a lot of darkness and his his villains are the same way so regardless with what we might get in spider-man 4 we really have no idea what that story could be i think it'll be good there's some loose ends we aren't just going to get tom holland in his homemade suit because we've got mj and uh, ned out there who don't know who he is and i think Mm -hmm. you can't just ignore that so you know how are we going to get he and mj back together they belong together they're real life couple they're an on-screen couple it must be done and then what are we going to do with ned is he going to become the villain by friend like he said he wouldn't in no way home because you know you said it so it's gonna happen Mm -hmm. probably Mm -hmm. but uh i think it'll be good i think it'll be great we've got kevin feige and amy pascal producing so we know that the marvel oomph is behind it and that's what we need yeah i think he's an excellent choice i mean you see what he did in shang chi like just think about 
the dialogue between Simu Liu and Aquafina, like I think that style of dialogue will work really well for the characters in Spider-Man that have already been established. And obviously what he can do with action is on display very well in Shang-Chi. And I think same thing will translate very, very well to a Spider-Man film. But yeah, the first thing that you brought up is the first thing I thought of is like, what does this mean for Shang-Chi too? And to me, it means our best chance of Shang-Chi showing up before Avengers is in this movie, probably. <laughs> like, I just don't know where else. He can't do both, uh, you know, on this short of a time frame. So, I, I don't know. I, I, he I can, would hope... you non-believer. <laughs> <laughs> not, everybody's, faith, not everybody's James Gunn, I guess. But, <laughs> but yeah, he. Um, I, I think he'll translate well, but it's just, man, what is going to happen to that character? What is going to happen to Shang-Chi? If you're a fan of that character, you, I guess you you hope that he plays some kind of pivotal role in the upcoming Avengers Doomsday or Avengers Secret Wars, but... I don't know if you're going to get that second solo outing before then. It does It does put Spider-Man, I know we've talked a little bit on this podcast before, and this is kind of the conversation about, is it a multiverse story or is it not? And I'm sort of more team, like, give me a street-level Spider-Man. I think that's why I was kind of excited after the conclusion of the last one, because it did perfectly set the board for that type of a movie. But this movie is releasing in between Avengers Doomsday and Avengers Secret Wars. And so it wouldn't really make sense mm. for Tom Holland Spider-Man to pop up in Avengers Doomsday and face some sort of multiversal crisis and then all of a sudden go back to the street to fight some rando and then all of a sudden now he's back out in Secret Wars. It, it almost seems like it has to be some sort of a multiversal story that connects the two. I mean, unless you sort of want to do the Captain Marvel thing where the story sort of backtracks a little bit, maybe tells a story before the Avengers films or something. I mean, Captain Marvel was in between Infinity War and Endgame, but still like it, it does sort of set, I think a weird, but interesting, uh, sort of uh, vision for Spider-Man 4 uh, because how are you going to balance the wider MCU of it all uh, based on just the location of that film but I mean hey box office wise I mean you couldn't ask for a better spot I mean the movie's already going to do huge because it's Spider-Man but now you're telling me it's in between the two Avengers movies like I mean it's gonna it's gonna float it even higher I mean this movie is is destined for the billion dollar club then some I mean it's uh, it's gonna be the next big thing I think for Marvel but but again I'm just I got a lot of questions you know I'm, but I but I Ultimately, I think Cretton's a great choice. I think he'll do he'll do an excellent job. I think you mean it's Dustin Daniel Cretton. <sighs> thank you, thank you. I'm glad somebody. I'm gonna did have it. to. I'm gonna have to step up like you, like I did, and then you upped me, and so I'm gonna have to try to up it later. It's just it's an escalation. One of those episodes. It's a puns arms race. Scotty will win. Uh, yeah, that is true. Yeah, we'll yeah. See. We'll see. Don't awaken the sleeping giant over there. <laughs> uh, man, I am. There's so many things that have already been said that I want to pick up the thread and talk about. Like, I don't know if I'll be able to uh, weave this into a, a cogent thought because there's so much uh, so much to say about this. Um, I am so upset that we haven't had a Shang-Chi 2. Um, my theory about why we haven't had Shang-Chi 2 is that the way that they set it up uh, at the end of Shang-Chi is supposed to lead into the next Avengers movie. And that they were planning to do a Shang-Chi movie. He was supposed to feature heavily, and they were planning to do a Shang-Chi 2 afterwards. That's why I, I believe they haven't done it yet. Um, that's why I've been saying for a long time. And then Destin Daniel Cretton gets, uh, apparently was attached to Doomsday, which or attached to the Kang Dynasty before. I didn't even realize that. That's really cool. Um, I imagine that they it gave him... The I'm sure we did. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely hey, you got to keep up with the news. You know, it's firing every week. It's just story after story. <laughs> What's more embarrassing about that, that we talked about it on the show and that I forgot, is like a few weeks ago, or I don't know, a month or two ago on the MCU cast, we were talking about which directors should direct the next Avengers movie, if not the uh, Russos, you know? Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, you know, Dustin Daniel Cretton would be amazing. And I was like talking about it as if it was my idea. And apparently <laughs> we had talked about it on this show that he was attached to it prior. Mm -hmm. So that's no good. That's no good. I have no memory. Um, but I, I wonder if they gave him this partially because they want to keep him in their stable. Like he has shown what he can do and wherever he goes to his, whatever other franchise wants to grab him up and use him, uh, it will be, it will be a big thing to be like the director of Shang-Chi because everyone's waiting on that set, that sequel. Um, so I wonder if they're like, okay, we can't give you Shang-Chi right now because we've got plans, but like 
Spider-Man? Like, no, who's going to turn down a Spider-Man movie? And I think mm-hmm. uh, you guys are right on that the tone is perfect. Um, for, for the, the Shang-Chi tone is perfect for a Spider-Man movie. This is a great choice. I love it. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's really wonderful. And then the idea that it sits between, we've had a lot of speculation about how Spider-Man will play into Doomsday and whether that he will, as the sort of like uh, father-son dynamic he has with Tony Stark, whether that will play into a Doomsday movie. And, the, and we've had a lot of conversations about how that could be a big twist ending or something at the end of Doomsday. Um, on this network, we've had those conversations anyway. Um, I don't remember what show they were on. Uh, but like the idea that that Spider-Man fits between, I'm really hoping that it is not a flashback and that it it, it like is a continuation of the story that's just focused on Spider-Man because that would mm. be some really tight continuity that we, I think we would all really like to see, like a, an Avengers movie that leads into a smaller story about Spider-Man that leads directly back into the next Avengers movie. Like mwah, mm. that is what I want. That is all I want. It'd be great. It'd be so good. I should know my co-host better because I thought I was going to be the one to come in with the fresh take about Shang-Chi. I figured everybody would be like talking about <laughs> Spider-Man and speculating about the future of Spider-Man 4. But I- I'm right there with you all. Like As exciting as this is, and I think it's uh, it bodes well for multiple reasons that I'll get into later, I continue to be befuddled why we haven't had some sort of continuation of Shang-Chi. Like, I- at this point, the fan expectation has been out there in the ether i feel like they should know about it how difficult is it to just you know throw him into a post-credit scene so that Mm. makes me feel really strongly that the reason they haven't done that is thinking about uh destin daniel cretton's previous attachment to the king dynasty i have to figure that shang chi is going to factor in a major way there and probably be one of like the focal point characters that we're following there i also think it bodes really well because Again, thinking about the fact that he was attached to the King Dynasty, and they cited that you know he was parting ways, and I, I don't even think it was creative differences. They just said, "Hey, it's not going to work out on this project. We want to save you for other projects." And a lot of times, when you hear buzz like that, it's all just you know uh, to placate the the media and the masses, and and you know make it seem like everything's okay when there might be upheaval behind the scenes. But this really does make it seem like he is valued. And they respect his vision and his abilities and want to, you know, keep him in the stable. So uh, to that end, it excites me. And I also think this this speaks to uh, things look good behind the scenes between Marvel and Sony. Uh, Not that long ago, we were like, are we even going to get a Spider-Man 4? Will No Way Home be the, the last collaboration we've seen? And it does sound like Marvel Studios had to make some concessions, especially regarding the nature of this story. But again, if it's going to be multiversal, setting it between the two Avengers films and having a guy like Destin Daniel Cretton at the helm, I think it it restores a lot of confidence and makes me that much more excited for it. It also makes me that much more excited for Wonder Man because, uh, as I understand, he's directing two episodes there. So while Mm. he has only done the one movie so far, clearly Marvel likes what they're seeing and uh, it, it makes me excited to see what he's got. Absolutely. All right, up next, early reviews from the Venice Film Festival screenings of The Joker Fully Ado. The sequel to 2019's Joker hit the internet last week with the response to the musical follow-up decidedly mixed. Critics seem divided on the film's uneven tone, with criticisms citing a plotting narrative and underutilization of Lady Gaga. Positive Hakes celebrated the performances of Phoenix and Gaga, as well as Philip's direction. The first film had its detractors and went on to become the first rated R movie to gross a billion at the box office. Are these muted first reviews enough to get the last laugh this time? Yeah, Joker 2 is going to be a really interesting test, I think, at not only the box office, but just critics and how critics respond to films. You know, at this point, we've got a very small number of reviews. Uh, A lot of people for like big sites and stuff haven't gotten a chance to review Joker Folia do yet. This is uh, just impressions from the Venice Film Festival. But it should be said that the reviews for the first Joker were not great at the beginning. And then people started to warm up to it as time went on. It had a strong audience reaction, like didn't really evoke much of a critic reaction in terms of like positive reviews, but the audience score really drove it. And I think what makes this one a little bit different is the last one, the reviews were that the movie would be controversial, right? Like there was a lot of reviews about this movie is going to inspire violence or this movie is going to cause people to, you know, like that was kind 
kind of the driving f- conversation, and that was why a lot of critics dogged on it early, I think, is because they felt like it was, in a sense, going to be some sort of dangerous movie or something. And it's mm. it kind of, I think drove the conversation at least from a box office perspective like positively because people wanted to see it like there was a lot of that uh have like stirring up people going to to see the film so there was the the reviews didn't really hurt it i guess necessarily but the the difference i see with this one is there's kind of two problems with the reviews and one is that a lot of the reviews are just that the film is meh, you know, like it's not that it's like going to be super controversial or whatever. It's just kind of like, I wasn't really that invested. And then the second one is that the, that Lady Gaga is not featured as much as a true co-lead as maybe the trailers would have you believe, which uh, some of the critics took issue with her performance was good, but she was just not on screen as much as you maybe think that she will be. And so I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens when, the the rest of the public get their hands on this movie and they really get to dive into it and see what they think and we start to get feedback from the general public about how they feel about it um premiering at the venice film festival i don't think is gonna ultimately do great things for the movie uh the ending has already leaked so be very careful out there if you're sensitive to spoilers like people are already talking about the ending throwing out spoilers to the ending and that's Mm -hmm. never good like that's that's never good uh for the conversation of movie especially when the ending is going to be somewhat controversial which i haven't seen spoilers but at least that's what i've heard about it is that the ending is going to be something that maybe not everybody is going to want to see in a theater necessarily. So I think it's, it's again, it's, I, I kind of see a lot of shades of the first Joker here uh, in that the critics didn't really know what to do with it. And sometimes critics can smell blood in the water. And when something is like, it's not very good, all of a sudden everybody dog piles on it. It's not very good. But then when the public sees it, they come around to it. And, and so I think like, will it reach a billion dollars? I, I don't know, maybe, uh, but I, I don't, I don't think it has to. Like, I think it just kind of like, if it's in that $800 million range or something, I think you consider it a success and you can walk away from it. Warner Brothers can walk away from it saying like, all right, we're good. Um, But yeah, it's going to be a fascinating uh, movie once those like main reviews start to hit from just the general public. I think we've got an Aquaman 2 on our hands. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if it's going to be that bad. (laughs) Not as bad as Aquaman 2. Aquaman 2 was was a bomb. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, let me let me let me let me qualify that. I think the Aquaman 2 had a lot of other things going against it, but I think that the Joker and Aquaman 1 both ha- li- lived at this time. They were b- put out a year apart, uh less than a year apart, and they both came out in like the 2018-2019 window of like mm-hmm. the everything is making a billion dollars. If it is a comic book IP, it is making a billion dollars. And I always thought that was overperformance for Aquaman, and I always thought it was an overperformance for Joker. Anyway, I, I really think that like the the Joker one overperformed, and I think the amount they invested in Joker two is crazy. Uh, I think this will do well, but I don't think it's going to do anywhere near a billion. I just, I, but but things are doing well this this whole year, so th- the box office is back. Like who knows? Um, but I just don't. Th- I I see it making like you know half a billion instead of a billion, something like that, which is not bad when Joker came out too. It was like a really unique thing, and now with Joker two, like does it do it enough to set itself apart from Joker one? Like we don't know yet. None of us have seen it, but that's a question that's going to have to be answered. Like, does it provide a unique thing that you have to go see in a theater or can you just wait for streaming? You know, like it's, it's going to have to answer for that. It feels like they know that and they've gone into it with that expectation of needing to plus it with it being a musical and it having Gaga in it and like tackling Harley Quinn and everything. Like, I think they know they need to go to the next level. Uh, and do something special, but I think the audience that wanted to see Joker, especially the audience that loved the first Joker, I don't know that the same audience that wants to see a musical featuring Gaga. Like it just feels very different. Sometimes that kind of counter counterintuitive thing can work because you pull in two audiences. So who knows? Maybe the Gaga fans will come out in force and it'll be really, really strong. Hmm. Yeah, I don't see this one performing like other musicals like i don't think this is going to be like a greatest showman situation where people are going back for repeat viewings to like sing along with the songs we know it's a a jukebox musical but i i fully acknowledge that i exist within a bubble when it comes to being very aware of like you know film discourse in the online space and i feel like i have trained myself and i feel like a lot of other people have gotten to the point where they kind of know how to take reviews it's like don't take reviews at face value especially like rotten tomatoes that's an 
aggregators. So just because a, a movie comes in fresh or rotten doesn't say a lot about the actual quality of the movie when it comes to an individual take. So for myself, I have curated, you know, about four or five reviewers that I, I kind of know their sensibilities. I know their taste align with my own and none of those reviewers have had the opportunity to see it. So these reviews don't really mean a lot to me. They don't, they don't have a lot of weight. Uh, I was a little startled. I will say when I was on social media and I saw IGN posted like a seven, it felt like a little bit of a slap to a f- slap to the face. I was like, wow, I wasn't, you know, seven's not terrible, but I, it just, it really felt muted. Like we, like we've said here. So, uh, I will be curious to see once more people get eyeballs on this thing, what kind of conversation is going to be going around it because I have not watched the original Joker from 2019 since I saw it the first time. And that's because I found it to be such a heavy and weighty experience. And I remember the kind of fervor and feeling around it. Like I remember seeing a noticeable uptick in security at my theater. Like there were security guards posted like right outside the the theater itself. So uh, definitely an interesting movie. And I think Matt, you brought up the point about like the first movie overperforming. I agree with you more about Aquaman to or Aquaman kind of being lumped in that situation. I feel like what 2019 Joker had going for it and what this film has going for it as well is that it's such an antithesis to what we've seen, even the fact that it is a musical. So I, I'm still holding out hope and uh, I will, you know, go see this thing for myself and you you know we're gonna talk about it here once we've all seen it. So. We're talking about it without seeing it because it's, which is really hard to do. (laughs) Um, I just watched the first one this year and one of the reviews that's quoted in the article we used called Joker Folie Adieu plotting. Mm. And I think you can say that a little bit about the 2019 one. I thought it was a great film. I I really liked it. I think it was unique and cool, but there are parts of it that are plotting. And so Mm -hmm. for a reviewer to say that, it's kind of like, well, I just watched it a few months ago and I feel like that's actually on par. I think that what this film has going for it is not just Lady Gaga, but Joaquin Phoenix. I think people who are movie watchers if they see that Joaquin Phoenix is in something they want to go see it because he's kind of got you know a cult following as an actor he does the extreme things he does things that are all over the board from Gladiator back in his youth to you know the Johnny Cash movie Walk the Line Mm. and so I think that the draw is definitely him and I think the draw is Lady Gaga and for a review to say that she's not in it as much as they thought she would be, we even said on this show, like, this is going to be Arthur having his delusions, right? He's in a mental state. We don't know that her character is even real. Right. So, you know, it's kind of like if it's that situation, well, then, you know, you set yourself up for those expectations going in is what that review sounds like to me. So, I don't know. I think that those all sound kind of harsh <laughs> for something that's kind of an art house type movie in the superhero genre, which is weird in itself. And so, it's going to be across the board with reviews. And I'm looking forward to it because I think it just looks really interesting. I remember when the trailer dropped and we talked about it on the show and we were all like, wow, this looks fantastic. So that's my, that's where I'm going in with it. Sometimes critics go into these types of movies with their minds made up a little bit too. You know, like mm-hmm. if, if they didn't like the first Joker, it can kind of be hard for them to jump a hurdle for the second one, right? To kind mm-hmm. of separate the two. Uh, if they saw the first Joker as, like we said, like controversial because it could be dangerous or it could inspire, you know, people who are violent or whatever. Uh, the, and they wrote that in 2019. They're probably not like psyched about a second one of those. So it, it's you, you, like you all, everybody said, you really have to take all these with a grain of salt. We, we got to wait until the general reviews out there, get out there. And then ultimately you got to wait till you see it yourself, right. To really mm-hmm. step away and see how you feel about it. But you know, it's first Joker had the same problem and look what it did. So we'll, we'll mm-hmm. see about Joker too. Yeah, for sure. I, I will say like, I, I think I, I, I spoke a little negatively about it and I am was purely talking about box office numbers. I just think it over from box office. I think the movie was, really interesting and really good and evocative and i think this one looks really good and evocative too so i'm excited for the actual movie uh i was i I just i didn't want my negativity about the box office to sound like i'm not excited about the movie (laughs) i'd be remiss if i did not mention that friend of the show bill bria did see the movie and uh we don't have you know a full review but his his take was positive Mm. i I trust bill i trust bill yeah (laughs) 
All right, up next, in a July 2024 interview, Kevin Feige confirmed more Marvel Studios special presentations like Werewolf by Night and Guardians of the Galaxy Holiday Special were on the way, with one actively in production at the time. Sounds like old news, but now Marvel head of streaming, television, and animation Brad Winderbaum doubled down on the promise while speaking with comicbook.com. Previously, Feige detailed that the special presentation wouldn't air in 2025, but... 2026. The Winderbaum's answer seems to insinuate it could be sooner. Not a lot to go off in terms of details, but what are our hopes and expectations for more 45-minute forays into Marvel Media Multiverse? Yeah, give me more 45-minute forays. I'll take them. I'll take them. <laughs> and, uh, I, f- I fought for this one to, to stay as a feature. A little peek behind the curtain there for you. Uh, we almost relegated this one to a lightning round, but... Uh, admittedly, there are not a lot of details to go off of, but I thought this would be a fun conversation, open the door for some speculation. And I, I really enjoyed those two special features that we've gotten so far, Werewolf by Night, as well as the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. And looking back on them, they couldn't really be more different. Yes, they both kind of you know focus on a holiday aesthetic and a certain feeling that's invoked, whether that's, you know, the the holiday cheer or and whimsy or the the spookiness that comes with Halloween and and, and spooky season. So I I'm thinking like these are a great opportunity. We've seen a lot of you know various Marvel Cinematic Universe formats come and go, be it from the films to the TV series. I still bemoan the fact that the one shots you know went by the wayside, but I think the special features are a really good opportunity to help fill out the universe. Well, If they want to start seeding some of the X-Men, you know, that don't have the crazy, crazy power set, I think if they keep the budgets down on these things, utilize existing sets and productions that are already happening, there's there's a real opportunity to create some value here. So yeah, seeding the X-Men I think is a great place to do it. Maybe revisiting some characters that we've seen but haven't got to spend a lot of time with, like Moon Knight comes to mind, She-Hulk comes to mind. Again, I know that they have to be wary about the the computer effects and and how much money they're spending on that kind of thing but if, if they wanted to do a little mini team up if you wanted to see you know moon knight with she hulk with miss marvel and some of the new characters that have been introduced and just have them have a little adventure i think that'd be great but i'm going to come back to one of my favorite things that the marvel cinematic universe has been able to do and while it's always exciting when they're pushing <laughs> the story and the narrative forward and and pushing the envelope I always appreciate when we get to go back and look at these little holes and pockets in the history and fill out the universe like that. So I've said it once on this podcast, I'll say it again. My ideal Marvel one shot is you bring in Alan Tudyk, you set it in the 60s, 70s, have a young Hank Pym in the height of the Cold War and just get some adventures with with Ant-Man. I would (laughs) love that so much. (laughs) Write the check, Marvel. (laughs) Yeah, I think the special presentations, they're cool, but they have to be a specific flavor of context, I think, for them to work. Because if you think about, like, from the studio's perspective, they'll they'll give you a movie because a movie has a return on an investment, especially, usually at least, a Marvel movie. And same with a series. Like, it'll have a return on investment. You can stretch it out over multiple weeks. But a special presentation really has to nail something. It has to be something that people are going to subscribe to Disney Plus for. They're not buying it. So you hope that they'll stick around for longer for it. So from a money perspective, the special presentations are, you have to convince someone that they're needed. So you think about the two that we've had. The one uh, that James Gunn wrote, the Guardians Christmas special, he was very open that he just went to Marvel and was like, I wrote this, I want to do this. And at this point, he had built up so much goodwill that they were like, this sounds perfect for Disney+. Plus. Bang, we make it happen. It's not going to work in a theater. It's not a series. like It's too short for that, but it's perfect for that format. And he had already written it. He shot it. Everything was good to go. So totally made sense. Same with Werewolf by Night. It was a shorter story. It probably wouldn't have translated super well to the big screen. Mm -hmm. Same as like you can't really stretch it out for a series but we're going to make it we're going to release it in black and white it's going to be around halloween like it's going to be a seasonal thing and it made sense so kind of looking forward it's like i think if someone comes to you who's creative and you trust them and you trust their vision and they've got an idea that you love but you just don't think like i don't think that's going to work on the big screen like maybe the character's too small maybe the story's too small or whatever but you love the idea those special presentations can i think be the perfect outlet for something like that so 
So it almost seems like they have to be, to me at least, it seems like they kind of have to be a little choosy in how they use them. But whenever they use them, they can use them in those very particular contexts. And I think it, they can be home runs. Like the Guardians one is the per, it's a perfect home run. It's set between two movies. You don't need to see it for uh, the movies. It's not super interconnected, but it's seasonal and you can throw it on on Christmas. And it's like, yeah. a, you know, it's like if you can do that type of stuff with it, like, you know, we've got a trilogy, but between movies two and three, we're going to do a special presentation. It's going to be, you know, seasonal themed or whatever. You can really, I think, nail that format. So it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's very particular, but when it works, it can really work. Yeah, I, I think you, you're definitely hitting around exactly what I was thinking, which is the idea that not only these movies that you talked about it paying off, and this is not a bet that pays off in a one in one viewing, but it is a bet that pays off for us Marvel fans who are like, well, now I watch the Christmas special every year. I watch Snoopy and I watch the Guardians of the Galaxy. You know, like <laughs> you gotta you gotta work it in there, and it's a wonderful life. Uh, you know, like it becomes one of those yearly viewings. No? Home Anybody? Alone. I mean, no. Muppets, oh, yeah, yeah. Christmas Carol. <laughs> all right, we all have our we all have our thing. I'm just saying. Those are the ones my family watched. Your point is- I'm, 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 uh, I'm getting uh, I'm getting vibes for a binger's uh, a binger's run. Oh Ooh, yeah, <laughs> binger's Christmas specials. Uh, no, I I I think that the, so the same thing with uh, Werewolf by Night being a Halloween special. It's a yearly watch for people. They can watch it every year on Halloween and get that vibe. Um, but also, they were both made cheaply. Um, mm-hmm. this is talking about that return on investment. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special was made on set. And in character with the characters who are already on set making uh, Guardians 3. So it's yep, like right. saved a ton of money. We have we had been talking about that on MCU cast for years, how that would be amazing. Why don't they make like a little smaller movie while they're making the bigger movie? They got the sets. They got the people there. Like make a, we've, we've joked about like make a romantic comedy with like, <laughs> you know, the characters in the background of the Avengers or whatever. While the big, somebody else can worry about the big spectacle and like just give us more time with these characters and that's what they did it's amazing um so i think doing that more and werewolf by night even the way they shot it in the darkness and with an older style of filmmaking where it was kind of cool and campy to have like practical effect sort of cheaply done off-screen transformation type stuff it's like that's just saving money you know what i mean like that movie that was made cheaply and with no named characters that were previously in the, in anything so it's like you know, it's it's just both those were made really smart and made with repeat viewings in mind, even though they're not a series or a movie that's going to be in theaters. So, so uh, it, they've done it smart so far, and I think they're going to continue to do that. Yeah, I think you've all hit the nail on the head. Jay, what you said made me think of like, oh, this was between two and three movies, and so it's like two and a half. And that's kind of a fun concept that they could do with these sequels and stuff. If they can do all the things you're all saying, make it connected, but you don't have to have seen everything, which I think is part of their goal with the special presentations, similarly to Marvel Spotlight, which is that still a thing or not? I can't remember. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So much has changed since (laughs) Echo came out. Um, I can't remember if they're sticking with that one. But yeah, I, I like that kind of almost like with some book series where they have like a nine and a half in between books nine and 10. It's like, here's a little short story. And really the two that they've done are so similar to like a five issue comic run where you can just read these five issues and here's a little contained adventure story or it's a side quest or whatever. And I, I would love to see that be more of a thing, but to everybody's point, be choosy, be smart, have fun and don't spend too much money. (laughs) No, no big deal. (laughs) Yeah. So if we're going to spend time with, uh, just let's go around real fast. One one character or series, who would you want to spend more time with in the MCU? Like if you're going to get a 45 minute presentation. Oh man, uh, this is Guardians hard. probably would have been my go to, and they've already done that. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go. Uh, Shang Chi's cheating, isn't it? One. After we've already no, had that not, long conversation, not. I feel like Shang Chi is probably the one that I would love to see more of. I could do a Sam Wilson, Joaquin Torres Ooh, special like presentation. Ooh, absolutely! And they're and they're shooting a uh, Cap Four. It absolutely could have. I mean, could have shot that in the in the in between times listening. on that. 
<laughs> we got go. all the ideas tonight. <laughs> it's too much star power and too much money, but I love the idea of like bringing back Jeremy Renner and Scarlett Johansson and mm-hmm. doing like a Black Widow slash Hawkeye type adventure. The because there's so yeah, there's so much like Black Widow Hawkeye stuff in comics, mm-hmm. and they're always going on like these side missions together and all this type of stuff. And would it break the budget? Yeah, but hey, it's we're having fun here, you know. Uh, but uh, I think it would be cool <laughs> to bring those those two back in and just do some kind of like fun like homage to their characters you know and and do some type of a cool cool side quest to be fun yeah yeah i love all those ideas so i I already mentioned maybe seeding the x-men and i mentioned young hank pym but now i'm thinking the eternals it would be cool to go back and Mm -hmm. look at you know some of the eternals like their one-off adventures you know gilgamesh and makari what have you see what they did they did Mm, throughout history we hardly knew you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, guys, if you are enjoying this show, we're here every week. We keep making this content. We work really hard to make this show and make it happen uh, and, and write the scripts and make the show. And really, we put a lot of, a lot of this blood, sweat, and tears into it, uh, and m- mostly sweat. Not a lot of blood or tears, but like a lot of sweat. Depends on the week. <laughs> yeah it's true it's a good point but if you do like what we're making here uh check us out on patreon patreon.com slash multiverse newscast uh you can uh, go to subscribe for four bucks and you get to add free episodes um and you get the uh live episodes um posted there so you can watch them after after they're live um if you would like to watch the show that way you also get uh special polls and special uh tangent talks and uh, episodes of the show and everything else. So, uh, yeah, join us over there if you're interested in supporting the show. That would be great. And we'll be right back with more Multiverse News. We've got uh, the lightning round right after this. Welcome back to Multiverse News. Uh, <laughs> let's turn straight to our Spotify poll. I wasn't here last week, so I, I, I didn't even... I don't even know what you guys are talking about here, but uh, <laughs> if Jurassic Park, I, I, I don't know the conversation. That'd be like, it's it's pretty self explanatory. We talked about the hot, hot cast in Jurassic World. What's it called? Rebirth. Rebirth. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we were just nice. talking about Jurassic World Rebirth first details, and this is the kind of poll question you get from Scotty when he's exhausted and running on fumes. <laughs> yep. I no, I love it. I feel like this is the kind of question you give from Jay Scotty at any moment, at any time. That's fair. Uh, That's fair. If Jurassic it's Park a great existed, <laughs> if Jurassic Park existed IRL, would you go? Um, and we have 34% of you said yes, 10% of you said no, 40% of you said heck yes, and 16% of you said expletive no. Have you guys seen the movies? <laughs> I <laughs> said I was heck a no. yes. You're telling I, me I get to see Jay, a dinosaur? you're going to die. <laughs> no, it's, no, I'm not going to do anything alive, stupid. I'll be safe. You'll be dead. <laughs> I'll be safe. Yeah, I think I would go to Jurassic World after okay. it's been established, especially. You know, like, I don't know about being the first person to the park. That does seem scary, like, in the first Jurassic uh, Park. But, like, the Jurassic World movie feels like it would, it would, I would, I would be one of those. It's been open for years at that point, you know? What are the, what's the, what's the odds that you're going to be there when the what's Indominus the Rex goes on a rampage? Honestly, uh, from <laughs> Jurassic World, that's the dinosaur kill that freaked me out the most. The one I'm talking about is whenever the pterodactyl picks up the lady and drops her into the water oh, and then she yeah. gets eaten by like the giant, whatever it's called. You know, I'm not a paleontologist or whatever, but what the big thing, <laughs> like that yeah. was because it's like, like, you know, you're swimming the in the ocean. One. Yeah, like the idea of, of something being under you in the ocean is like the human's greatest fear, you know? So like mm. the idea of getting eaten by a sea monster like that, uh, I don't even care about the raptors getting eaten off the toilet, whatever, <laughs> you know, getting eaten <laughs> by that big sea creature. Like, you might that's, care That makes me think moment. twice. It uh, <laughs> makes me think twice. But uh, but I'm still down. I'm, I'm in. Yeah, you, you cited what I think is the worst death in all of, of Jurassic Park is when you get bitten in half while taking a crap while hiding. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, when you got to go, you got to go. That's right. <laughs> Works both ways. <laughs> I can't even remember a specific death, which is crazy, but I, I, it's those little dinosaurs, the ones that seem oh. so unassuming. Yeah, that killed the little girl. She did, did they die. kill the little girl? She, she didn't, didn't die. die. She was she hospitalized. Escaped. It was later on the movie. You have the guy that was being a real Peter Stormare's character. Cowards just kill the kid. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah. gross. They cr- they're creepy. Because that would be a slow yeah. death. Or the one that spits the poison. Yeah. Ooh, I'm yeah, not going. Yeah. You guys go send yeah. me a postcard if you make it. 
Yeah. Well, even if we don't, you'll you'll hear about our devs on the TV, and then you'll, <laughs> then you'll be get like, the postcard later. <laughs> Those idiots. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's dive into the lightning round. As as we do on the show, uh, we do the lightning round. I'm going to read a, a story, and we can claim it by saying our name, and uh, and then we will claim the response to that story. And if you would like, you get one rebuttal for the entirety of the lightning round. Um, so here we go. James Earl Jones, the legendary actor known for his iconic baritone as Darth Vader in Star Wars, died Monday at his Dutchess County, New York home. He was 93. Haley? I mean, I'm speaking for everybody, right? This is just oh, so yeah. sad. But uh, a non-Ganarian, he lived a really great life, I'd say. And um, the list of contributions goes so far beyond Star Wars that there's too many that to list. And so just a great loss, but we know we'll have his voice with Disney um, after, after this. And it is kind of wild that we just talked about him last week for doing that so rest in peace james indeed <laughs> yeah for sure indeed warner brothers has released the trailer for a minecraft movie starring jack black and jason momoa and directed by jared hess the game-based film premieres in theaters on april 4th 2025 scotty I'm not a big Minecraft player. I've played probably collectively maybe five hours of Minecraft, but I've seen the discourse online and reaction to this trailer, and it's just like they made a choice, and it reminds me a lot of that Sonic film, the very first Sonic film from a couple of years ago where we got treated to ugly Sonic, and the internet made that change. Uh, it seems like it's and a little we were too right, late in the game. The What's that? <laughs> we were right, by the way, in right, bullying right, yeah. them to change Sonic. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it seems like it's probably a little too late in the game for Minecraft to be able to make a similar shift here because it's the whole world that they've decided to... It's block-like, but it's very uh, rounded blocks. It's it, it does not look like the game at all. So I, I kind of fear for this one. I think it might go the same route as Borderlands. I mean, Minecraft is huge. It's the mm -hmm. highest-selling game of all time, so maybe there's a built-in audience. Maybe they're going to get the younger folks. Maybe they're going to get the families that this one does... Uh, I think aesthetically feel a little bit more like Jumanji um, and both mm -hmm. of those films from a couple of years ago did yeah. reasonably well amongst families, but it's, uh, yeah. I, can you make a video game movie without having Jack Black in it at this point? Because <laughs> Borderlands, <laughs> Jumanji, uh, I, I feel like I'm missing Mario another one in there. Mario. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, Mario. Yeah, of course. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. The I mean, it does not exist. <laughs> I'll tiny but to say that I think this movie will do fine because of what you said, okay. the families. Like, I think younger younger kids are s obsessed with Minecraft. Mm, <laughs> it's like, sure, it's sure, just sure. like, like, the, like I think they'll want to see it. But this trailer was, like, really cursed. <laughs> like, it was, like, so, <laughs> like, I just thought it would be animated. Like, I, I don't know if, if I missed something, but I think a lot of people thought it would be animated. And mm. that th they were just doing voices. And then all of a sudden, it's, like, live action. But it's like, it looks weird. It's like, how do you do live action when the world is already like blocky and supposed to look, you know, kind of like an old video game program? So, oh uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it mm -hmm. didn't look, I don't I didn't think it looked, I didn't think it looked great. I, no. I walked away being like, this is <laughs> one of the ugliest trailers I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> like yep. it looks super unfinished and I don't know. We'll see. I mean, but I think it'll still do fine because of the brand, but yeah, not a, not a trailer that, uh, I didn't see what I expected to see, I guess. <laughs> tiny butt i'm gonna be the contrarian here and just say i i thought the aesthetic worked like especially for minecraft i thought the aesthetic of the little blocky rounded heads and kind of ugly faces reminded me of minecraft but sort of brought to life i so i i liked it i liked that that choice i think the rest of the trailer looks kind of trash but like the choice <laughs> of the aesthetic didn't bother me okay. i don't know huh? it did look exactly like jumanji like they just literally just took <laughs> oh, that yeah. took that plot and put it in this movie Okay, ahead of the main Emmy Awards, scheduled for Sunday, September 15th, last weekend saw the Creative Arts Emmy Awards ceremony held at downtown Los Angeles' Peacock Theater, where the FX network enjoyed an incredibly successful evening with 14 wins. Shogun broke the record for a single season of television, while The Bear took home seven awards as well. Notable wins include The Dark Knight's Nestor Carbonell as the best guest actor for his role as the Portuguese merchant Rodriguez and Jamie Lee Curtis for best guest actress in a comedy series for her appearance in The Bear, her first Emmy win. 
Haley, I don't think either of these are a surprise uh, because these are kind of the darlings of TV right now. And they're both uh, Disney properties, both owned by Disney on FX and Hulu. So uh, actually, I guess they're both FX shows. They're doing a lot of good stuff on FX, but <laughs> Shogun winning oh, yeah. 14 Emmys at the Creative Arts Emmy Awards is just indicative of what it's going to do at the main awards ceremony, and I think the bear will be right along there with it. Uh, it should be noted, a lot of our geeky content shows also took home a lot of these Creative Arts Awards. Um, Ahsoka comes to mind for costuming, I know, and a lot of the other ones did too. So, yeah, go Shogun. Alison Brie has been cast as key villain role of Evil Lynn on Amazon, MGM Studios, and Mattel Films' live-action take on Masters of the Universe. Scotty? Yeah, I think this is appropriate casting. When I think of Alison Brie, I don't necessarily think of her as a villain or an antagonist. I think the first thing I ever saw her in was Glow, uh, where she did have you know some pathos and the ability to be a little bit of a heel, but then I went back and saw her in Community where she's just a total sweetheart the whole time. But I think if this embraces an aesthetic that I'm expecting them to, she will be... I'm thinking about the what I know of the character. She's evil. It's in the name, Evil Lynn, but she's not like the <laughs> big bad. She's not Skeletor. She's like evil, but of all the henchmen, she's kind of the one that seems like she has the most common sense and the willingness to work with our heroes. So in that sense, I think it's pretty good casting. And Allison Bree's somebody I can root for. And uh, if she's given more opportunities, I think that's great. Only Murders in the Building has been renewed for season five. Currently, season four is dropping weekly episodes on Hulu every Tuesday, leading up to the finale on October 29th. Scotty, I have not checked out any of the new season that's airing currently, but I am excited to do so when I have a little more free time. But yeah, Only Murders in the Building is great. Obviously, it's a great team that enjoys working together there between uh, Steve Martin, Martin Short, and Selena Gomez. And uh, congratulations to Selena Gomez. I don't think it's in the lightning round, but she uh, is officially a billionaire and I think one of the youngest uh, billionaires out there. So good for her. Wow. wow. Slay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Netflix has greenlit the long-rumored Twilight animated series now in production. Based on Stephanie Meyer's Midnight Sun, it retells Twilight from Edward Cullen's perspective. Matt, creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Probably a little emails. too brooding. A little too brooding Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's like... Too emo. It's the one thing if you get the story from the teen's perspective who falls in love with an immortal vampire... It feels a lot creepier from the immortal vampire's perspective falling in love with a teenager. I just never, I always thought that's creepy. Uh, and it's, yeah, it feels creepier from their perspective. <laughs> I don't know how you make that work. You make it animated. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's yeah, it. Yeah, make it animated. That's yeah, there's your, there's yeah, your that's, fix. That's true. <laughs> Some of the things they do in animation are far more egregious. <laughs> like, they really get away with. Uh, okay. Uh, in a deleted blog post, Game of Thrones author George R. R. Martin criticized creative choices in House of the Dragon's second season, hinting at future posts addressing the issue. HBO responded, citing the need for difficult choices due to the scope of Martin's work. Jay, um, man, I love some George R. R. Martin drama with HBO. Like, why does every franchise have to be like this now where, like, the studio and the creative don't get along and they're always beefing about something? And, you know, there were... There were some legit problems with House of the Dragon season two that he could have criticized. And he's he was always saying, like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to talk about what I really think. And then he finally puts it out there and it's they changed my writing. It's like, dude, come on. Like, <laughs> like uh, the only reason we're in this situation is because you never finished that damn book and they had to finish the end for you. And so now we got to go back and do a prequel because no one liked the ending. So. You know, maybe take a look in the mirror. Go back to the go back to the keyboard for a little bit. Finish the book, and then maybe wouldn't be in this situation. <laughs> Didn't he come out like today or yesterday? And he was like, "Oh, the, the, all these shows are why I can't finish the Winds of Winter." And I'm like, "But you're not writing these shows, George. <laughs> go back and try again." <laughs> oh man, he's a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> a Reacher spinoff is in development at Amazon Prime with showrunner Nick Santora writing. The series is expected to focus on Francis Neagley, played by Maria Sten. Scotty? 
I have seen a <laughs> handful of episodes of Reacher on Amazon. I liked what I saw, uh, but I know there are a lot of fans of Reacher. It's it's definitely when the new season aired, there was a lot of conversation around it. So I, I know people like it a lot. I have no idea who the performer or the character that she's playing is. So, uh, you know, I, I'll just say that I'm excited for people that are excited for that show. Hopefully it's a success and uh, they'll get even more spinoffs. In a People interview, Michael Keaton discussed that his real name is Michael Douglas, but he had to change it when joining SAG-AFTRA in the 1970s. Now, he plans to use a hybrid name, Michael Keaton Douglas, for future projects. Haley, <laughs> you do you, Michael Keaton, but you're always Michael Keaton. It's too late. It's <laughs> too late. Yeah, it's Sorry. too late. It's too late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard of actors doing this like a few when they first hit or something. You know, like I have the power now to use my real name. I'm going to use my real name, stuff like that. I've never heard of someone they're like <laughs> way into their career being like, "All right, I'm changing it." Yeah, it's like the scene strange. from Office Space with the Michael Bolton. He's like, "Why should I change my name?" Like he's the one who sucks. <laughs> <laughs> What's funny is if you listen or read the full interview he says like oh it was supposed it, the credit was supposed to take place on this recent indie film i was supposed to do but i forgot about it and didn't follow up on it <laughs> well and if you don't care michael the then neither do we <laughs> yeah, and when he came up with the name keaton originally he was like i don't know i looked in the phone book or something like that and I'm like, well, that yeah works. he doesn't even that's know so where he iconic. got it he doesn't even that. know where he got it uh, <laughs> that's the crazy michael hilarious. douglas isn't even dead like what are you doing <laughs> that's crazy <laughs> whatever <laughs> i mean i guess i you know so maybe it's like a connection to his family thing like carrying on a family name and feeling like you want your like family recognized that's a thing people care about being a movie star is so hard <laughs> well i mean like this is like in the it's, office it's where andy tried to change impact. his name to drew and they were like we're not calling you drew <laughs> like we're calling you andy like you've been andy your whole life we're not doing it we're not doing it. and he's like okay i guess i'm andy <laughs> <laughs> Nothing rolls off the tongue like Michael Keaton, Batman. Oh, I rest mm -hmm. my case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Warner Brothers is in early talks for Ocean's 14 with George Clooney and Brad Pitt set to return. They're reportedly seeking all quiet on the Western Front director Edward Berger to helm the sequel. Jay, uh, Clooney and Brad Pitt just got off of Wolves, I believe. Is that the, that's oh, yeah. the title of that movie, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where they work together and sort of from the trailers has an Ocean's Eleven type feel. I mean, that movie was iconic when it came out. It passed just mm -hmm. Clooney and Pitt. I mean, the whole cast is stacked for that movie. So I think people would be interested in it. I mean, people love that pairing specifically of George Clooney and mm -hmm. Brad Pitt. And they love to work together. So, yeah, I think it could totally work making a sequel for that movie, even this late. Like, I think people would be interested in it for sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. Tiny Butt, I freaking love Ocean's Eleven. Um, I really enjoy 12 and 13, too. Like, I just, I, I love, I love a good heist movie, and I love those particularly. They're so cool. Uh, Soderbergh's directing is great in those movies. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, so I'm very interested. I'd like to see them get a really good director. So I really, I haven't seen All Quiet on the Western Front, but I really hope, uh, hope the directing is good because I think that's really important to the the franchise. Peacock has ordered The Burbs, a comedic mystery series based on the Tom Hanks and Carrie Fisher 1989 film starring Kiki Palmer and produced by Brian Grazer and Seth MacFarlane. Matt, this sounds great. I think this just sounds really fun. Uh, I, I totally see The Burbs uh, being stretched out and kind of turning into sort of a you know, a, a great engine for episodic television. Uh, I think that sounds really, really good. Uh, it rem you know, the, the, the sort of drama of a cul-de-sac is always kind of fun in television. And then you add in the supernatural elements and make it sort of like, you could definitely see like an adult version of stranger things with like a comedic bent. And there's like some sort of demonic presence in the town and the building on that over the course of a season. I think that sounds awesome. So I'm in and Se and uh, Seth MacFarlane being involved gets me, gets me hyped because I like his stuff. Uh, he's just had good creative stuff um, that has, that has lasted the test of time to some degree. Um, mm -hmm. And particularly I love the Orville. <laughs> I thought you were talking about family guy. No, I don't really care, but I don't really care about family guy, but I like, I know a lot of people, Orville. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of people do love family guy, but I don't really like it. It's not my, not my sense of humor. Um, Universal Pictures debuted the teaser for Wolfman, uh, which stars Christopher Abbott as the classic movie monster. Also co-starring our three-time Emmy winner, Julia Garner, 
Uh, Sam Yeager and young up-and-comer Matilda Firth. The film will release in theaters on January 17th, 2025. Scotty? Oh, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, we're kind of in this, like, renaissance of old movie monsters that we're starting to see. Uh, We know that uh, Nosferatu is on the horizon. We know that uh, there is a... um, what's the swamp the swamp one what's it called creature from the, uh, La- creature black, from the lagoon. black lagoon that's right that there's one of those uh, we just talked about a few weeks ago that's being remade by i believe blumhouse so uh kind of interesting to see these like fresh takes on some of these old movie monsters and kind of seeing what can be done with it and wolfman is in that same crop of uh, of of movies Scotty with a tiny butt. You, you took it in a similar direction that I was going to, but I am reminded of Lee one the director. His previous effort was Invisible Man, which again is taking right. one of those yeah. old universal characters and kind of recontextualizing it. In that sense, we didn't get a lot from this teaser, but Christopher Abbott's character says, like, you know, I'm here to protect my family. I'm going to protect you from whatever. And then to find out that the, he is the actual threat, he is the threat inside the house, it just seems like uh, Lee one is interested in telling these horror stories that feel super grounded in the sense of like dealing with domestic violence and the the threats that are within the home. And I think that's uh, definitely a timely and uh, palpable way to take it. Todd Stashwick, who played a key role in season three of Star Trek Picard, has joined Paul Bettany and James Spader in Marvel Studios' Untitled Vision series. Matt. Uh, Todd Stashwick was great on Picard, and he clearly has... Um, a strong uh, relationship with Terry Metalis. He was on his, I believe 12 monkeys series before he was on his season of Picard. And now he's going to be on his vision series. So he's been on everything he's been, he's, he's, he's uh, been a showrunner for. Um, so uh, there's a relationship there. Uh, and Todd Stashwick played a character that would have been very easy to hate and kind of was in the beginning, but his uh, ethos and his acting, I think really pushed through the sort of, uh, hateable nature of his uh, rigid Starfleet character he was playing and eventually like you really uh, grew to care about his character. I thought that was really a lot of fun in Picard and I think adding him to Betney and Spader sounds awesome. I think you answered my question there. You said he was a rigid Starfleet character so he's a human in that show I take it in Picard right? Not an alien? Yes, yes. He's okay. a human and a, and a Starfleet officer and it's sort of an antagonist to our like you know it's, it's, it's Star Trek Picard season 3 is the return of the next generation cast and mm-hmm. they're sort of like wanting to do their we're gonna sort of like the old crew used to do we're gonna ride again and steal a starship and do the fun okay. thing and go save the universe like one more one last time and he's like the rigid starfleet officer sort of standing in their way and being like you okay. guys are insane old guys like get out of here like but he they really they, they pulled it together in a way that really made you care about his character and i think okay. he's, but I, I'm that's interesting to hear because with the photo that's been circulating around with this news like I, I take one look at that guy and i was not familiar with him but i'm like if he's not going to be playing like a synthesoid because he looks a fair amount like paul bettany i feel like he's got like strong features like you could make an, a synthesoid hmm. out of him pretty easily if not i also thought he kind of looks like hayward um, from WandaVision, who was responsible mm-hmm. for the creation of White Vision. So if he's playing, you know, a type like that, I I think it could work pretty well. And it sounds like that's kind of his uh, his wheelhouse. Hmm. Yeah, I could definitely see that. X Men ninety seven creator Bo DeMeo officially filed a lawsuit against Disney last week to overturn the NDA he signed upon the exit from Marvel Studios in March. In a thirty minute video on his OnlyFans account. DeMeo explained, quote, the rumors being spread around me or online are lies and they are offensive, but more concerning is that they they're a smear campaign designed to discredit my credibility in order to cover up the egregious prejudicial misconduct stretching from select crew members of X-Men 97 all the way up to the top of Marvel Studios. The Mayo also alleged that Marvel Studios had a problem with him being gay, black, and open about it, which led to his firing. Jay, um, there's not too much to add here in terms of like developments. Um, DeMeo is still accusing Marvel of the same thing that he was a few weeks ago, and you know Disney is still standing on the egregious behavior sort of fire back that they had at DeMeo. And so that hasn't really changed. Like nobody's really accusing anybody of anything new. Uh, But what is new is that this is officially moved into court and it's bound to be a very long and drawn out case in which it seems to be 
the NDA and certain parts of the NDA are under question. It also seems to be like the writing credits for X-Men 97 season two is sort of what kind of seemed like the whole root of this whole problem in the first place are, are sort of being brought back up. So it's probably going to get pretty messy, uh, I would imagine, uh, as we start to move into the court system for this thing. And I would say that we're this is going to be a story that's going to be around for a while. It kind of almost reminds me of like the Jonathan Major story that it just it was a mm-hmm. slow trickle of information for what felt like a year, uh, where mm-hmm. it was just small developments over and over and over. And so again, not not too much to add in terms of like what the division is. It's more just like if you're interested in an update on it, it's just that it is in the legal sphere now, and it's something that you can follow uh, from a legal standpoint. It's also something you can follow on his OnlyFans for like thirty dollars a pop. <laughs> thirty dollars i mean you could come over to our patreon for four i mean come on like weigh your options here <laughs> what a plug <laughs> let's uh let's 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 uh if we get uh now we're not gonna be doing the same thing he's doing okay don't get it yeah, twisted i mean but, you know but, uh, <laughs> if, if you if we get 15 new patrons this week we'll join <laughs> the only fans and watch it for you guys <laughs> <laughs> one of us has to be the designated weekly like all right who's get, who's in bo de Maya's only fans account this week <laughs> getting Nose all the, nugget, the news nuggets <laughs> 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 who drew the short straw this week <laughs> those aren't the nuggets i wanted <laughs> <laughs> Beetlejuice Beetlejuice earned $111 million stateside in its opening weekend, making it 2024's third highest opening and the second highest domestic debut for September ever. Haley, the nostalgia factor is strong. People want it. They go see movies because of it. I have not seen it. I haven't had time. And I just don't know if I really want to. I think I'm just going to wait for this one to stream because it's just not a priority for me. But I think this is, as much as I'm not like super into this movie, I'm happy for it that it did really well in that opening weekend because it just lends credence to what we've been saying about the box office. So good for that. Songwriting duo Binge, Pasek, and Justin Paul just got the E for their EGOT, winning a Creative Arts Emmy for the song Which of the Pickwick Triplets Did It? Uh, from Only Murders in the Building Season 3. Haley, <laughs> uh, if you don't know what EGOT is, it's Emmy, Golden Globes, uh, Oscar, and Tony Awards. So they've got all, all of them, and that's great. As much as I didn't love Season 3 of Only Murders of the in the building the witch of the pickwick triplets did it song that steve martin performs is i mean it's just top tier it's amazing it's a tongue twister like it's almost hard to just to say it normally much less sing it so um if you don't think you know who binge pasek and justin paul are they've written some of your favorite things like the greatest showman uh la la land which is what they got their oscar for and all kinds of other awesome things i noticed you did not include dear evan hansen I forget about Dear Evan Hansen because it's you want to talk about something that's heavy and hard to uh, watch uh, or think about. That musical is a heavy one. <laughs> okay. I've never seen it. I just <laughs> oh, it's really sad. It's really rough. It tackles really uh, challenging material. Mm. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, the highly anticipated HBO original comedy series, The Franchise, dropped its first trailer, setting the stage for what promises to be a sharp and irreverent look at the chaotic world of superhero movie making. Slated to debut on Sunday, October 6th at 10 p.m. Eastern, uh, the franchise will also be available to stream on Max. Jay, I thought this trailer was really funny and looked really fun. I think the creative minds behind Veep and maybe a couple writers from Succession are involved with it. And you can really tell it's got the Veep energy a little bit, like in the comedic style. And uh, it kind of pokes fun at the ideas that we talk about a lot on this podcast about franchises and the the idea of a franchise and how like the the big dollar and the marketing and all that type of stuff that goes into a franchise and kind of the funny side of that kind of like what the the boys does like in a very different way but the boys kind of experiments with with uh, talking about just like culturally how where that's at and how interesting that is and so I, I thought it was a fun trailer I think it's uh, definitely a show I'm going to want to check out especially like because when Max hits comedy like Veep being the perfect example when max hits comedy it really can hit like on a really good level and um i got high hopes for this one daniel Bruhl also involved uh you may mm-hmm. know him as zemo uh he is he is in this and uh looks to be having a great time uh tiny but the only 
I think I agree with you on all of that. Um, and I do think it seemed pretty good. The only thing that I found lacking was it didn't feel like it was coming from a place of necess- and, and maybe because it just isn't in the trailer, but it didn't seem to me to be coming a place from a knowledge or love of actual geeky franchises in the way the boys does when they lampoon these things. The boys always feels very specific. This felt a little more just like behind the scenes stuff that is annoying to creators trying to create sort of real art. And it sort of felt like a criticism more than a loving lampooning of franchise stuff, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but just like watching it as a person who follows all these franchises, um, it didn't, there was nothing in it that felt specific to any of the sort of geek media that I follow. Whereas the boys were hitting it constantly with like these little, just one liners that were just killing me because they were so specific to how, uh, and that, that maybe that will be in there, but it didn't feel like it from the trailer. It felt more like it's going to be an industry criticism sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Following last week's report for that Josh Brolin was the top choice to play Hal Jordan in Max's Lantern series, the actor has since officially passed on the role. Scotty, uh, we didn't bring it up when we were talking about it last week, but he wasn't the only name being bandied about, and he would have been great. He would have been great, but apparently Matthew McConaughey's name was in the mix as well. As far mm. as I'm seeing, uh, he's out as well. I don't know how official that is, but the other two names that are being floated around there are Timothy Oliphant and Chris Pine, which I think are both great choices. But with Chris Pine, he was already Steve Trevor, and I know this is a new universe. So that's why <laughs> I, once I heard Timothy Oliphant, I was like, as great as Josh Brolin would have been, Timothy Oliphant is inspired. That's kind of if that doesn't pan out, I'm going to be a little disappointed. I'll be honest, but I'm uh, <laughs> open to what they decide. We'll see. Hmm. And if you're thinking about not listening to our episode last week, because the title says uh, Josh Brolin for DCU, Hal Jordan, just go ahead and listen anyway. It's, you know, it's <laughs> it, like just, to, you can scroll past that part and just listen to the rest. <laughs> Hey, we had a nice conversation about that show. Hey, you know, the, hey, they came out with it. They said, hey, we're going after him. He didn't want it. All right. So it is what it is. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, that's our show, guys. That's our news. Um, thank you for hanging out with us. Let's go around and tell the people where they can find you online. Jay Sisson. Yeah, I'm at Commute the Podcast uh, weekly, and we did have a new episode this Monday. So please come check us out at Commute the Podcast. And um, as always, the five star reviews on Spotify and Apple, not only for this show, but for all of our various corners for my show, for Animation Deliberation, for Source Pages, for MCU Cast, like all of the shows. All of our guests typically have shows. Like if you just take a minute and go do the five star reviews and stuff like that and hit the follow button, that stuff really helps out. So please go do that uh, whenever you hear people plug in their stuff. It, even if you're you know not going to listen every single week, that kind of stuff still helps out. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, thank you. A lot of you guys did do the five star and uh, yeah. the Spotify reviews for us this yeah. week. That really helped yeah, a yeah. lot. Thank you. Um, and Haley Hobbs. Well, if you give Source Pages a five star review on Apple and hashtag What If Wanda, you'll be entered in our contest to win a copy of one of the new books, What If Wanda, Maximoff, and Peter Parker were siblings. So, extra incentive over on Source Pages. And meanwhile, Brian and I are two thirds of the way done with our Scarlet Witch 2015 coverage. Um, this week had some kind of heavy issues in it, and so. I did have some trigger warnings (laughs) that I talk about before the issues, but it's uh, such a great run and we get to talk a lot about Wanda and her mental health and her as a character. So go check us out. Mm, Great. And Jay Scotty St. Clair. Yeah, over on Animation Deliberation, the podcast that takes action, animation, and cartoons seriously, but not too seriously, we have a few things percolating. Uh, It sounds like Zuhair and I are going to be talking about My Adventures with Superman Season 2 a little later this week, and then I've uh, I've been talking to Jeff Randall about doing a primer for Vox Machina ahead of Season 3 premiering on Amazon Prime next month, so uh, excited for those things. And then uh, on Bill and Ashley's Terror Theater, we're going to be talking about the 2020 22 Danish film Speak No Evil, as well as the remake that's coming out this weekend, starring what looks to be a very scary James McAvoy. So excited for that. Check Ooh. it out. Nice. Sweet. And uh, yeah, you can find me every. We're, we're going to be covering uh, live uh, reactions to Agatha over on the Marvel Cinematic Universe podcast. Hmm. We'll be doing live reactions uh, here on the YouTube channel and also, uh, uh, you know, dropping those in the. Uh, uh, podcast feed so 
uh, if you if you don't follow the Marvel Cinematic Universe podcast, go give it a follow. I'm very excited for Agatha. Uh, we're only like eight, eight days away, so that's really exciting. I have one more plug. Oh yeah, sorry. Please. I always forget to plug Hate Watch when Ashley and I do it. Oh <laughs> and yeah. We're gonna watch Madam Web on Sunday, September fifteenth at one <laughs> o'clock central because uh, we're breaking the rules and watching a movie we've both seen because of Ashley's iconic cosplay at Dragon Con. So yeah. uh, if you think I'm not forcing her to wear it, think again. <laughs> so check us out on twitch.tv slash stranded panda TV and there's an event in the Facebook group that you can go uh say you're going and get a reminder. Yeah, definitely check that out, guys. Um that's that's a lot of fun and her cosplay was epic very it was so epic. good <laughs> mm-hmm. uh her and katie both had uh madam webb cosplay and it was really fire um all right guys we'll be back very soon uh here on multiverse news see you next week peace you stay classy multiverse hey thanks for listening to multiverse news uh or watching it or whatever you're doing you know eyeballs or ear holes whichever thing uh we uh we do this show every week and we appreciate you listening uh strandedpanda.com is where you can find all of our podcasts and uh thank you for listening uh check us out uh wherever you get podcasts uh hit that subscribe button hit that like button hit the little bell icon whatever you have on whatever service you're doing rate us like us we're really thirsty that's what i'm saying (laughs) 